Hello and welcome back to the Notcast, episode 251 today, 24th of November 2022. Seven years ago today, 24th of November 2015, I saw my last show on the U2's um, Innocence and Experience tour. And last week I saw Bono um, on his first and so far only solo tour um, promoting his autobiography surrender 40 songs one story and uh, for those of you who've joined the notcast relatively recently uh, in the early days when i wasn't quite so good at doing this in fact saying that i'm good now is kind of arrogant when i was less bad i think is probably the best way of describing it uh, I, I talked a lot about the u2 albums and the tours and, and their meanings to me and my experiences um, as as a fan, as the band changed and I changed and lives changed and the world changed around us. Uh, Surrender, Bono's autobiography, is like a lot of things that have happened very, very recently. Uh, a product, I think, of the COVID-19 pandemic, where musicians and artists couldn't tour and couldn't work and told their life story. I've bought an awful lot of autobiographies recently. Um, Surrender is, is uh, one of the best um, autobiographies I've ever read. You know, the, the guy can write. No, no mistakes about it. And today I am going to talk about this and the live show that I saw last week and the the audiobook version of Surrender as well. There are going to be a few spoilers. If you haven't read the book, I'm going to try and be light on spoilers. But there are, by necessity and virtue, a few things which I'm going to have to talk about which are in, in this book. So the last time that I saw U2 live on the 13th of November uh, 2018, uh, was in Berlin, the last show of the Experience in Innocence tour that was later released as the DVD uh, Experience and Innocence Live in Berlin. And at that point, I had seen U2 something like 10 times every year that they'd toured that decade. Um, I'd seen U2 a lot and I was not ready to let go of the band. Uh, and during COVID, there were a number of times when it became very, very clear to me, or at least the idea came very clear in my mind, that we might not experience life the other side of COVID the way that we once had. So the idea of, well, I'm just getting on a plane and going to Berlin to see a band that I love might not be a thing that would happen again. Being in the same room as the songs that changed my life and shaped me and changed me and made me who I was today, that might not happen again. Even if we had the money, we might not have the world circumstances that would allow it to happen. Um, and the last time I saw U2 in Berlin, I was very, very aware when I was watching them that I was something was coming to an end. And I wasn't sure I was ready for something to come to an end. Uh, when people look back at the period of 2015 through to about 2018 as a U2 fan, you will have had the... Uh, the Innocence and Experience tour, you will have had the um, the, the live in, in Paris experience. There will have been the Joshua Tree tour. That's a bootleg Blu-ray of it. Um, there will have been the, you know, odd one-off shows here and there. And there would have been the Experience in Innocence tour, uh, which played in Europe and America. And you, you would have, as a fan looking out from the outside, I think in years to come, people will look at that period as a second golden Indian summer almost of the band um, a a period which were actually you look back in retrospect and you were like we were as fans very very lucky to go through that period to see a band play seven tour legs to stage three different tours release two studio albums um, in in a four-year period is it, a very heavy work rate by their standards and of course doing it because they want to not because they have to but at the end of that I knew that it was the end of an era and I wasn't ready for the band to finish touring. I still wanted to see them. I was still getting something fresh and new out of it. And I got used to, to seeing the band very, very regularly, which having once been an 18 year old or, or actually come to think of it, a 16 year old in my childhood bedroom on the 31st of December, 1989, pressing record on a C90 and a C60 for the shows at the Dublin Point when they were broadcast on the radio. The only place in the universe I wanted to be that night was in the room watching that band. And then, and it took me almost a decade until I actually got to see the band. 
and then to be able to see the band more than once. And then I suddenly thought, this this is, you know, the thing that I always wanted to do. Uh, and so growing up, I hate to say it, I think I'm an adult now, at least on the outside. You know, like a lot of adults, I am I am a person who is still the child that is inside me, but I'm I'm driving a grown up version of me, you know, like a grown up suit or something. And so I thought during the COVID period, and that was a you know, 16, 18 months, it was a long period of time from when society shut down on the 23rd of March, 2020, through to the final release of the last set of restrictions on the 31st of July, 2021 in the UK. There was over 16 and a half months, you know, 500 and something days, near enough, when I felt in my mind that I may never see a band again. I may never stand in a room with the people that had, had helped me. Well, I might never get to experience the songs that had been friends when I, I felt utterly alone in the world ever again. And so there were a couple of things that I wanted to, to experience. There are a couple of bands, and I knew if I got to see those bands again, that I'd survived this horrible experience. And I might have said, the world was in it, a huge amount of trauma uh, for that year. You know, it's only afterwards when you experience it, it's kind of like we, we survived the burning of the world in one respect. You know, the, the bonfire of our way of life for a period of time. And we came out the other side of it and we survived. We're different. Not all of us have made it. The world will never be the same. But we made it. And to me, seeing a couple of bands, one of which I talked about previously, the Twilight's had, uh, and, and one of the other ones, U2 or Bono, I thought if I get to see them again, I know we, we've made it through this to something else. And so last week we went to see Bono at the London Palladium, uh, 2,200 people, Bono's first solo tour, no cameras, phones, recordings or anything like that were allowed. And just to be in the room again and to see a musician whose work has been with me since I've been a child and now as an adult, seeing the musicians and the, the artists whose work I, I respect and enjoy and connect to, growing older and navigating through being an older person is, is really important to me. Now, some artists, you, you kind of go, I want to listen to the songs that remind me of the, the better times and the songs that remind me of the younger times and all that. Whereas I'm kind of like, I want the songs that, 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 that show me what it is to be alive now. I don't want a 30th anniversary tour of, of what was going on in 1987, although I know that's what we got for the Joshua Tree. I want to, I want to be given the map now, through the world now because I'm still trying to make sense of the world now. I haven't got all the answers. I've still got loads of questions. And I had a lot of emotions watching the show and reading the book and hearing the audio book. This is an integral part of understanding you two as a band, as artists, as people. This book is, is very, very well uh, written. Um, it is fascinating and it's broadly chronological and to get into spoilers and you've had nine minutes by the way um, it opens with Bono reliving and and, and reenacting um, the closest he has come to death uh, which was a problem with his eccentric heart um, and a blister on an aorta um, which can kill very suddenly very quickly and with very little warning and ex talking about his experience of lying on an operating table, being operated on, being opened up by science and butchery and savagery, by men with knives to rebuild his body so that he can continue to live. Um, and as you get older, you kind of go through experiences where you realise you're not young anymore, you're not invincible anymore, you can't bounce back from... You know, you end up sinking pints and the pints end up sinking you. You start taking a drink, the drink starts taking you. It's those type of situations. 
Um, and obviously last year I had a major health event. Um, I had what was described as a, a I think a, a psychogenic blackout uh, caused by um, stress, effectively a human blue screen of death, uh, where I rebooted and started again because my body and my brain couldn't cope with, with what was happening around me at the time. Um, these happen to about one in 8,000 people. They're really quite rare indeed. Uh, most people have never heard of them. Uh, some people have a lot, and some people only have one. But no matter whether you have one or ten, it's terrifying to think, I might not have made it out of that. Um, and there's a, there's a a theme that runs all the way through this book, where Bono talks about his life, and the fact that his glass is very definitely more than half full, and at the same point being very, very aware of mortality. And as I've mentioned before, um, I think Salman Rushdie has a theory about um, premature death awareness syndrome in people that are, that are driven to strive to create art. People are aware of their own death and their mortality and the fact that you know the clock is ticking and it's always ticking every second of every day. Um, and you think about some of the major artists that have been compelled to create have been almost trying to achieve a form of immortality on a very base kind of subconscious level. They're not necessarily fully conscious of that. And in Surrender, the, what the, there's, there's a couple of formative incidents. Uh, the first one is, is the death of Bono's mother, Iris, who had an aneurysm at a funeral. And the rest of the family were at the funeral. And obviously, not it's not a case of walking into the room and seeing that someone's died of an aneurysm upstairs. It's, it's a case of seeing somebody collapse in front of you. And, and that's the moment where they suddenly start to experience it. They're kind of like what's known in the trade as a, a, an end of life event. It's the event beyond which everything starts to decline very quickly and very rapidly. Um, especially when you're when you're older, there's normally something that happens, and after that, that's the beginning of the end. It could be you fall over and break your ankle when you're 84. Uh, it could be that you have an aneurysm at your dad's funeral. It could be any one of the you know a gazillion things, um, and that is the event which started, I think, formed a huge number of things. Um, my mother died when I was young, and that put in my mind. A series of of uh, dominoes, consequential events. You know, I'm not going to pretend that I didn't. I I lived hard after that period of time for a period of time. I was very definitely hedonistic, and uh, I drank too much, and I I stayed out a lot. You know, and I did things that were young and stupid because I was young and stupid. I'm not going to pretend for a second that I didn't. Um, when I was a, a young man, not necessarily equipped with the tools of the world. And all through surrender, and, and this is where I, I see a lot of, of my life experiences in, in, in this book. Um, and I think a lot of us will, will, will see and identify with things that have happened in their lives and, and light them up uh, and, and, and line them up with events that have happened in this book. Because some of the human experiences that Bono talked about here are very, very common. You know, mortality, ageing, love, loss. Um, all those type of things. And the opening lines of the book, uh, and every every one of the 40 chapters is named after a U2 song, uh, the opening lines are, I shouldn't be here because I should be dead and I can see the lights in front of me. You know, there comes a time when you're very aware that the, the path ahead is shorter than the path behind. Um, and it opens with, with Bono talking about uh, a man at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Um, standing over him uh, as a magician with nerves of blood and blades of steel, climbing onto his chest, wielding his blade with the combined forces of science and butchery. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think everyone that's had a, you know, a major scare has had that moment where you almost step a little bit outside of yourself and you see yourself as perhaps other people would see you. Or perhaps an ability to step outside yourself and see a reality and go, oh God, this is serious stuff. As a book, this is absolutely fascinating. It is broadly chronological. Each of the 40 chapters are named after um, a U2 song and normally an integral and important one. Iris, Hold Me Close, Chapter 3, The Name of Bono's Mother. 
And the, the fascinating thing about this is that these are stories that only Bono can tell or only band members can tell. Um, it's sometimes light on detail. Sometimes, you know, albums get very, very cursory uh, recognition and mention. Um, but that's not because they aren't important, but because other things at the time are important. Now, I'd be fascinated to have read, and, and this is not what you get in the book, I'd have been fascinated to read, for example, the psychology of what's it like to be on stage in front of a stadium full of people? What goes through your mind? How do you navigate going down to Tesco's and buying sandwiches once you had 80,000 people staring at you the moment you open your mouth and sink? You know, how does that affect you? What, what, how does money change who you are and how you relate to the things and events that are going on around you when, when you, you have enough money to not have to work and then you're in a situation where you have the ability to step beyond um, the constraints of money and then think about, well, what happens if I do the things because I want to do them and not because I have to do them? You know, how does that affect the psyche? What does that do to your ego? Does that lie to you? You know, those type of things. And of course, the, the other major events that happened is, is two events happened in the same week in 1976, uh, 42 years ago. No, actually not 40, 46 years ago, last week, uh, Bono joined a band um, called the U2s uh, with three other men. Um, the Edge, also known as Dave, Adam and Larry. And he went on a date uh, with a woman called Annie, who um, he has spent the past 42 years with. And what's lovely and wonderful to, to hear and read in this book is, you know, the, 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 the idea that no human being is an island. In order to succeed and to thrive, we have to have people around us that support us. The idea of the self-made man um, is, in my opinion, utterly nonsensical you know if you're a music artist you need the band with you you need the drums uh, and uh, you need um, you need the bass and the guitar and, and the songs and you need the ability you can't just have a triumph of, of ambition over ability you need to be able to articulate the, the things that are going on in your mind and it's it's a fascinating there are elements and times in the book where we start to get to the point where where Bono's effectively telling us about people like Nelson Mandela and Bill Gates and and stuff like that, and I kind of go, I'm as someone who's paid attention to the world and politics, I know about these things. You know, I've seen these things. I know about Nelson Mandela. I know who Bill Gates is. You can work on an underlying assumption that there's a certain degree of knowledge and information, uh, you know, which which the reader most definitely has. Uh, and that there's a point in uh, nineteen probably about 1997, 1998, where, where, where U2 starts, and, um, well, more correctly, where Bono starts another band, and that's, um, although he calls it a band, it isn't, it's a charitable venture, which is a, uh, built around looking at justice and poverty and um, activism. Uh, and, of course, there's, there's an element of, of, of going, that's actually a different story. That's a story that, that I'm really, really interested in hearing in, but it's not the story which I think this this book necessarily could concentrate on. I'd be really interested in knowing about the art. I'd be really interested in knowing about the artist. I'm not so necessarily invested in understanding the activism. Um, there's less mystery around that. Um, it's more around, you know, trying to go, what is it that makes this guy work? What is it that makes this guy tick? What's the thing that's driving him? It's not a travelogue. Uh, you know, if you want to know about the early years of U2 in intimate detail, uh, this is the book, North Side Story, for you to get. If you want to know what they played on uh, in March 1997, uh, or when they opened the Pop Mark show, you need to get this book instead, U2 Live. Or, in fact, go to U2 Gigs or U2Songs.com for all your uh, set list and trivia needs. But what this is, and that's absolutely fascinating to have this, this understanding of it, is it's a, a travelogue that kind of, well, not a travelogue, but it's a chronologue through ideas and concepts and themes. And so each one of, of the U2 songs has, has multiple concepts and themes that are at play at any given moment in time. So, uh, for example, a song like Invisible is, is addressing, from one point of view, the idea of the... Um, 
the the preconceptions you know, that your 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 father and your parents and the world might put upon you, but also at the same point, it's a song that's detailing about how you refuse to be pigeonholed by the the, the products of your past, and um, that line about you don't see me but you will. I am not invisible. Invisible is one of my very favourite U two songs, right? and it's you know to to understand and to hear the the perspective that as an artist Bono has taken upon that song is is very interesting. But when they put together a, a set list, for example, and, and that set list has um, a number of songs, songs are grouped together in chunks. So, um, for for example, and I'm just going to pick pick this out, uh, the Zoo TV show, for example, which is obviously is here, uh, which does get mentioned in the book. It has a section towards the end um, where where it kind of does this with bullet the blue sky, running to stand still, where the streets have no name, pride, um, and those four songs are kind of a a journey through what's what's called the heart of darkness um uh, you know a, a thematic collection where you're looking at songs that detail but what is it to, to deal with things like you know politics and drugs and power and and cohesion and and then you know liberty and justice and equality and fraternity and all those things that go with it um and you've got the section in the 2015 tour the cedarwood road section um, where you've got uh, cedarwood road well, more correctly, actually, it starts with I Will Follow, uh, which is a song which is around uh, the death of Bono's mother and the idea that um, he, he will follow them wherever they go or, or they will follow on in his footsteps, for example. And then Iris, uh, obviously named after his mother, Cedarwood Road, Song for Someone, which is a song about his relationship, Sunday Bloody Sunday and Raised by Wolves, that address the, uh, the, the bombings that took place in, in Dublin in the 70s um, and, and then you've got the other section which is you've got uh, what I call the you know the linear chronology of the Joshua Tree tour uh, where you can follow the band through uh, talking about you know what they've done and how they got there and the experiences that they had to get there um, and then the, the section where you've got exit mothers and disappeared and Miss Sarajevo and it's a beautiful day which kind of deals with, with things like you know politics and power and control and um, you two shows are, are tightly scripted thematically they're joined it since each song is about multiple themes those songs placements within those set lists exist as a point of being able to address at least one element of those themes and to work as a bridge between those themes uh, and this is something that happened with the stage show as well which i will i will get to address shortly this is a uh, a book that's that's absolutely essential to understanding Bono as a human being and you can hear all the way through there's still you know that 16 year old kid at the heart of it, who just happens to now be in a 60 year old body with a little bit of experience, who's trying to, to make sense of and to understand and to navigate what it is to be an adult, what it is to be become who the person that they are going to be as a relative grown up. So, the, the lyric in City of Blinding Lights, where, was that, where time won't take the child out of the man, that line. Uh, but then there, there's, there's also kind of like an, an approach in there to, to understanding, well, when you think about that quote about the statue, when somebody said, I think that's Michelangelo, said, how did you do, you know, the statue of David? Or whatever, and he said, well, I just chipped away all the bits that didn't look like David from the rock. And, and this is the same thing that what they're talking about here is building on, you know, the foundations of the, of the past and the history and the past experiences that they've got. And then going into becoming the person that they always could have been. Um, and, and what we get with Surrender is a, a journey through a life which has many, many facets to it, you know, husband, father, son, rock star, activist, or actualist, depending on your point of view. And then, then kind of exploring how all of those tie into one cohesive individual. Uh, and it's an absolutely fascinating and essential read to understand. Obviously, as you know, some people do like to take the piss out of Bono, including Bono himself, by the way, he's very good at... Uh, bursting his own bubble and pointing out that, you know, the, the three school friends that he's been in a band with for the past 46 years are also good at bursting his particular bubble. But then we get to things like the activism and he's going, well, I've got an opportunity. What can I do to perhaps make the world a better place in ways that most people hadn't necessarily considered? Um, it's a, a fascinating read. But again, I would have been much more interested in hearing about the, the art and the artist as opposed to the activist element of it. You know, I know that poverty is bad. I've got you two records. I've got crumbs from your table. I know that that, that those are, that, you know, poverty is, is sexist and, 
and sexism is wrong and bad and evil and boohoo and all that stuff. And I get that because if you don't get that, then you're you're the kind of guy that watches Star Wars and doesn't realise that the Empire is actually a metaphor for you, you know? Like, I'm sure that there are some people, uh, especially some conservatives, that watch Star Wars and think, ah, we're the rebellion. It's, a, you know, the Libcucks that are the um, the baddies. And I kind of go, actually, no, Hans, we, we're the baddies. You know, mm -hmm. the death head skulls on the uniforms and stuff are a bit of a giveaway there. Um, but we've got, uh, in this book at least, you know, a, a, a compelling and fascinating insight into what makes the man the man. Um, and there's lots of very common, very shared experiences around grief. And and Barnum writes very interestingly and, and touchingly around the relationship that he has with Ali, the fact that um, she had known him for a very long time and knew him when and before he became uh, both successful and famous and rich um, and addresses that guy um, as still just like a grown-up version of the dude that she met when she was 16, you know, it's just him with a few more years bolted onto it. Um, and it's very important to have, you know, somebody that keeps you tethered to and rooted to the ground. Um, probably not a great idea um, to, you know, that's uh, the quote was, well, what, well, what attracted you to multimillionaire Paul Daniel, for example, although I, I think that that was a, a genuine and legitimate position. You could get into that type of situation. And the, the book addresses the repeated themes from different perspectives and, and from different views. Um, and so songs about multiple themes, songs like Lemon, Dirty Day, uh, Pride, Where the Streets Have No Name. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Uh, Vertigo, for example. All those songs, which are built on multiple things. There's, a, oh, there's also a fascinating discussion of Bono's relationship to his father um, and, and the way that, you know, people's repression and their guarded elements and their, their approaches are not necessarily showing emotion and so on and so forth uh, I mean that to, to some extent that you are always your father's son so you know for example on the on the occasions when or when I when I do have conversations with my dad I always get the impression that he thinks of me as being about three years old for example and sometimes in some of the conversations which which Bono refers to, and he acts out in the stage version of, of, of the book, is you kind of go, oh yeah, there's there's always going to be a dynamic like that, isn't there? And then all of a sudden the table has turned and the man that was the father end up, uh, end, ends up kind of needing and, and, and wanting the, you know, the support and love of his children um, as opposed to, to being you know, the, the leader and the head of a household. Um, it's absolutely fascinating to to see and understand that and then go that's very familiar i've been there i, I kind of know some of those feelings i know some of those emotions um, i think most human beings have, have got kind of that type of thing and if you have an unexamined life it will pass straight over your head you'll never think about it but i mean certainly i'm not saying that i'm navel gazing but i spend some time examining you know where i am in my relationship to other things and, and thereabouts um so I want to to be clear that I think Bono has done that work. You know, he understands who he is and how he is and how he fits into you know the dynamics that he's got and the strengths and weaknesses of the relative people around him and the acceptance that there is of him. And the audiobook version of this, by the way, runs to twenty hours. It is enormous. Uh, it's described as the uh, the Sergeant Pepper of audiobooks, which is broadly actually correct um, because it's not just uh, a guy reading out. Um, just the words and doing it in a very bland it, monotone and you then kind of end up with with text and you kind of end up reading a section out and you're going well that's not very interesting so sometimes I think audio books aren't, aren't well done it's just a guy reading out his book and it happens to be whereas when when Bono for example would, would read it out and he'd talk about recording the Joshua tree was a purple patch for the four for four of us he would put in the accents he would impersonate the people he would take the drawl of someone like bill clinton or the way that nelson mandela would use diction and language and and kind of represent those people through the book uh, the book the audio book by the way also comes with um a substantial amount of, of sound effects and it's it's an immersive experience it's like listening to to 
to Bono talking about his life in an unguarded way, which he hasn't done before. Every time you hear him int interviewed, for example, or when he's he's talking on on television, he's got a shtick, and this isn't a bad bad thing. He just he knows how to present his story in a way that's going to work on television or on stage. And he's a, you know, a salesperson coming from a long line of salespeople on his mother's side. Um, and he's not trying to you know, sell you a cockatoo or anything here. But what he is trying to do is trying to, to shed a little bit of light on and the, the life that he's lived, which has been pretty damn extraordinary, to be honest. Um, but the audio book also features short excerpts from 40 re-recorded versions of U2 songs performed by U2 that are tantalising. And I want to hear the whole thing. Um, but also you kind of go, well, actually, that's a really interesting way of reinterpreting your past worlds from the modern perspective to go, that was who I was when I was 18 or 28 or 38. And now this is me at you know, 62 explaining or, or reviewing who I was. What did I mean then? Why did I say that? And try to make sense. Use that old quote about, you know, life can only be lived forwards, but can only be understood backwards uh, from a philosopher whose name has eluded me um but but Bono is here clearly you know doing the work to understand his journey through life and the um, the audio book is absolutely essential as well if you get an opportunity to hear it this is one of the best autobiographies i've read um it, it's written by somebody that, that clearly has had both um a number of of extraordinary experiences but also has an extraordinary perspective on an understanding of those in a way in which many people don't and then the stage version of it which i saw last week I think there's two shows left, so I'm going to try not to get too spoilery, is firstly, how wonderful it was to be in the room with the songs that helped me become who I was and how, how good it was to see an artist who I haven't seen for a number of years, healthy and in fine, fine voice, by the way. Um, his voice was incredible. Um, and, you know, that's a man that's born to sing. And the... There are sections in the U2 shows, and, and I think I'm particularly I'm thinking about the, the Berlin show, which is quite tightly scripted, uh, and, and there's a narrative that runs through the show, there's themes that are picked up through each one of the songs, uh, and then the, picking up one of those themes and then dropping that theme and then picking up another theme from the same song, such as the song Dirty Day, for example, and joining it together. Sorry, long day. To create a a path through his life and their lives and their world told through the, the, the format of songs. It's not just, well, we'll put the big hits at the end and, and you know, we'll have some vague imagery. There's, you know, there's a thought and there's an application that goes to these. And so this is the type of thing that we've got with the stage show. So the stage show isn't a guy reading from a book. It isn't songs with a bit of patter. It's a, a two hour experience of Bono taking some of the key events in his life, which have been told through through the book, reenacting them on stage with you know a visual presentation and sketches and photographs and things like that from his life and putting the songs into their context so you fully understand that this is what I will follow is about this is what with or without you is about this is how these songs work and operate you know these are the things which the artist was trying to express um, and sometimes you know you look at a lyric and you go well what, what's, what's what's that lyric about and and then you look at a song like out of control for example stories for boys i will follow these type of songs and you go i understand these songs better than i did before i i watched them on stage or before i read the book i understand now how these songs work what part of his life he's trying to, to kind of express and articulate through the work which is on stage uh, and so for example a song like mofo um, which is, is mentioned, albeit briefly in there, which I personally I think it should get a chapter title if it doesn't already have one, I don't think it does, um, is, is a song again, about, again, about the death of someone's mo mother. And you're kind of trying to unravel all of that as it, you're going through the experience of it. The stage show is a phenomenal experience. It is the nearest thing that you will get to Bono on Broadway, um, where key songs that detail key events in his life are taken out from the U2 catalogue and they're examined from the life of an individual talking about their life and their experiences. And not about, ah, oh, here's a song for ya, as David Cordell might say, jammies in a robe. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're taking those songs and going, these are the songs which 
saved and changed my life and formed parts of my personality. And Bono said, well, actually, they're, they're huge chunks of me. And these aren't just songs. These are, you know, my, my interpretations of what's happened in my life. These are parts of my story that have got me to, to this point in this reality. Um, and uh, it's absolutely you know, fascinating and integral to, re to really understanding the story by, by, by listening to it. And the stage show has him starting from that moment of the major health event and moving through to the work that he's done all through his life to try and understand what the core questions of like who am i where am i why am i here what am i there what am i here for what is the purpose am i here to make art am i here to make money am i here to to lift people's souls am i here to shine light on how to to perhaps navigate the murky waters of life what what, what am i doing why am i why am i doing this and presenting the songs with narratives that are wrapped around them and then taking the themes all the way through. It's a thematic journey through, I think, the key obsessions of Bono's life from childhood through to adulthood and how he's grown and changed and evolved from a child to a man, using the songs as the template by which he would explore those feelings and arriving at the point where he goes, and I am finally here. And as John Lennon said, you know, life is the thing that's happening to you while you're busy making other plans. When I was addressing that in the context of the songs. Um, so you've got 12, 13 songs in the set, starting with City of Blinding Lights. Um, and to me, there was an element of City of Blinding Lights about having it as the first song back. It is kind of going, oh, you look so beautiful tonight. It's, it's kind of like almost saying, like you, I can't believe we've made it through this huge traumatic event and we've made it through to the other side of it. And I, like you, think you look so beautiful tonight because as an audience, it's almost a love song to an audience in some respects. And although admittedly, it is a song about the first time he went to, I think, New York City. Uh, but also it's about saying, well, I can't believe I get to do this. I can't believe I get to sing for myself. Or I can't believe that I get to communicate these ideas. And then as audience members, also there's an element of going, we see ourselves in those songs. We see ourselves in those lyrics. We see ourselves and our worldview in that. And um, this is like a song of welcome. Uh, then you've got Vertigo. Um, then you've got a little bit of Miracle Drug in London, which is one I went to. And then With or Without You, again, the first time I've seen a Joshua Tree song since uh, Brussels in 2017, although this actually is a bootleg of Amsterdam. I wasn't sure if I'd ever see a song sung from, from the Rush Retreat ever again, actually, after uh, in the middle of COVID. I remember when I was working and I was watching Bad from, from Amsterdam on, on the television and I just had to stop and go, God, I miss this. I miss this feeling. I miss this moment of, of standing in a place with thousands of strangers and we're all feeling roughly the same thing. And I was like, I don't know if I'll ever get to do that again. Now, th that was twofold. The first one was from a world perspective with COVID. You kind of go, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to do that again. And that was really tough. And then the other one was from a personal perspective, following what happened to me last year. It's kind of going, I'm not sure. I wasn't sure whether I'd be able to do this again, whether I'd be able to experience this again, whether even if the world got back to some form of normal, whether I would be back to some form of normal, whether I would get to see the songs that have shaped me and who I am. You know, and it, it was a it was a victory. It felt like a victory to get into the show and to be able to see it and to see it happen and to experience it because I wasn't sure. I really wasn't sure. I was like, I don't know if I'm this this thing which has been such a huge part of my life, going to see music, loving music, experiencing music. I didn't know am I ever going to get to see that again? Uh, it was quite something. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. I had feelings, you know, and I'm British people, we don't have feelings, but I had feelings. Um, and then in the rest of the stage show, uh, we had out of control, the first song written on his 18th birthday. Uh, we had stories for boys, which hasn't been performed by you two in, in a full form for something like 40 years. We will follow, um, Iris, which to me is an absolutely essential song in understanding you two's body of work. Uh, Sunday Bloody Sunday, which of course talks about the uh, the bombings in Dublin in um, in the, the 70s and the 80s, 
uh, also addressed in the song Raised by Wolves and Please and um, The Troubles and all these other songs. Um, then we had a move into kind of like, you know, the, the, the combined activism and sense of unity and justice, which, which drives most people. Most people that are looking for change in the world are idealists. They believe a better world is not only possible, but achievable, and they're working towards that. Even people that complain, sometimes they're complaining because they can see how things can be done better and differently, and they're striving towards achieving that. You know, it's not just going, I hate this, etc. It's going, no, this is not good enough. This can be better, and the experience can be better. And a song like Pride, or Where the Streets Have No Name, and you could... And hearing the, the the reinterpreted versions of the songs, and you kind of you see those songs in a different light. Sometimes, and you know, I've had this is having seen you two so many times, and having them sing, I still haven't found what I'm looking for so many times. It becomes a point when you you need to reconnect to the lyrics and go, that's what this song means. That what that's what this song is about, you know. And you go, that is a heavy concept to put in a song. I know BB King said, you know, these are heavy lyrics. But to be able to to think about how those songs have shed light in the darkness um, is is very important. Then we have there were two more songs before before the show came to an end. One was Desire, the other one was Beautiful Day, and I think Beautiful Day is a song that a lot of people will go, nah, it's like they, you know you give love a bad name or whatever, and it, it isn't. It's a carpe diem of a song. It's a song about. You know, feeling the grass growing under your feet and the sun hitting your face and, and about that moment where you, you realise, well, you know, any day above the turf can be a good day, can be a beautiful day, you know. This could be the best day ever. This is no time not to be alive. Seize that moment. And, it, and it's about almost having come so close to, to mortality, you know, both personally um, and, you know, with the people around you. And, I mean, for me this year, this year has been awful. You know, there's been two or three friends that I've known that have died, and they're you know younger than me, uh, and they'll never get to be as old as me. Um, a couple of family members um, have died. There's been some you know enormous mortality smacking me in the face this year, and I'm very very aware of of how beautiful and precious things are. There have definitely been moments this year. I I've stood in rooms with bands. I've met friends and I've I've kind of thought this nearly never happened again. Not just on a world stage, but on a personal stage to me. Um, I know it, it sounds a little bit like catastrophizing, but I know the thing that happened to me last year was really fucking scary. Um, and it's a real bit a real worry because I I personally I'm I'm not ready to die. I've got lots left to go. I think I've got lots of experiences, lots of feelings, lots of incredible moments ahead of me. And I intend to have all of them if I can. And Surrender as a show is, is you know, a man as one who is a child living in a man's body as an adult, staring at his mortality in the face and making sense of, of the life that's happened around him and the future that he has ahead of him. Um, and a friend of mine's father died recently uh, and she went to the show and I, I kind of thought wow man that's gonna that is a raw wound there you know in, in, and I mean I, I felt it and my, my grief is a lot more distant in the past than a lot of people's um, but Surrender was a show that, that really made me feel very glad that I was both alive and that we experienced it it's, a, it's not quite performance art but it is very advanced it's certainly far better than what it could have been you could have thought surrender is going to be just a tossed off guy uh or more correctly a tossed off gig a guy reading out bits from the book and then going here's a song for you and going you know instead of going well about let's say let's pick out the, the lyrics to cedarwood road i was running down the road the fear was all that i knew i was looking for a soul that's real and then i ran into you and the cherry blossom tree was a gateway to the sun and a friendship once it's won, it's won. And you could look at those lyrics and you could go, what does that mean? 
But then in the context of this, this book, the stage show, the story, the audio book, it all makes sense. This is Bono making sense of his past, looking back at everything that's happened to him as, as an adult and going, I was there, this was real. And this is this this is what it meant, you know. And it, it it's an essential part of being a U two, uh, essentially essential part of understanding the U two body of work is this book. It's it's absolutely brilliant. Sorry, yeah, I should probably get a you know a percentage cut from from uh, the publisher for this book. But uh, the stage show was so much more than I hoped or or feared it was going to be. I thought it might be. Well, here's Bono talking for forty minutes, and here's Bono singing, you know, six songs for half an hour. And and here's him taking some questions from the audience, and it's not. It's a very tightly scripted, deep dive through the core themes of his life and the death that has surrounded his life, and um, learning how learning how to live through through all of that. And living well is, of course, the best revenge, as REM once sang. Um, I'm so glad I went to see this show. I really, I really thought that I might never see a band again on stage. I really thought I might never see my friends again. I really thought I, I might never, we might not come out of this as a, you know, civilization. And here we are on the other side of it. And that it was just one hell of an experience, really. I don't know where I. What am I meant to say? How am I meant to wrap this up? I don't know. Um, it was, it was, um, yeah, it was quite an experience. And uh, apparently it's been filmed. So when it comes on Netflix or something, watch it and then think about what it's like not to see it on a screen, but what it's like to sit in a room and to experience it happening right in front of your eyes. And you don't know where it's going to go. And you've got that, that collective sense of community with 2,000 people, most of whom you've never met before, and we're all experiencing the same things. We're, we're growing older, we're trying to experience and understand life. And this is, this book is, is, is Bonner's way of going, this is what I learned upon the way. And it's absolutely fascinating. Um, so yeah, I'm sure it'll turn up in the works for three quid post Christmas. Um, if you don't buy it before, buy it then. It's, it's one of the best rock autobiographies I've ever read. And the stage show was an incredible experience. I'm so glad that, that we had it. Um, and for me, it felt like, like I said before, like a victory, like a, a survival. Like we'd, we'd been through a battle. We'd survived a war. We've come out the other side. There's that moment where you look at yourself and, and the people around you and you go, looks like we nearly made it. And uh, yeah, to the future. The future needs a big kiss. Um, yeah, that's Surrender, uh, my last U2 episode for quite a while until the next album comes out. Um, it's, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say. I thought I'd never get to experience seeing the songs that, that shaped who I was again, and I did. Um, and it felt amazing to be back in the room and to have that. I really miss shows. I really miss live gigs. Um, and I'm so glad that we've got them back. Uh, okay, that is not cast 251. That's me talking about the book by your man Bono, the book what he wrote. And um, yeah, next time, hopefully, about something else, not quite so heavy. Um, so in the meantime, take care of yourselves and each other. Stay beautiful, and I'll see you all soon. Okay, bye. <laughs>